الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله اللهم اغفر لي ما لا يعلمون واجعلني خيرا مما يظنون ولا تؤاخذني بما يقولون أحمدك ربي وأستعينك وأصلي وأسلم على خير خلقك سيدنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم أذن الخير التي استمعت واستقبلت آخر إرسال السماء لهذه الأرض ولسان الصدق الذي بلغ عن الحق مراده في هذه الخلق وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأنا محمد عبده ورسوله حمل الأمانة وبلغ رسالة اللهم صل وسلم عليه وعلى آله وصحبه ومن تبعهم بإحسان إلى يوم الدين رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وأحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Dear sisters and brothers in Islam I greet you the greeting of Islam السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته It's indeed a pleasure to stand here again in front of you and present some thoughts uh, just to emphasize what Brother Omar said uh, about uh, how the Prophet وسلم, connected at personal level and emotional level with the youth. Uh, with the exception of Abu Bakr Siddiq, Omar ibn Khattab, Abdul Rahman ibn Awf, and a few others, most of the Sahaba, when they accepted Islam, were between the age of 10 to 20 years old. So most of them were youth. And they followed him because he, alayhi salatu was able to connect with them at personal level, at emotional level. Alhamdulillah, Rabbil Alameen. <coughs> excuse me, I'm, uh, I have some sore throat, so please excuse me if uh, I cough a little bit while I'm speaking. Uh, the other point I like to emphasize is uh, the incident that Brother Omar mentioned about this young man who uh, want the Prophet Sallallahu to give him permission to commit zina. Uh, scholars of Tarbiya, they uh, deducted over 10 lessons out of this hadith alone. I wrote an article about this once and I found these 10 lessons about this hadith. So every thing we have in the seerah really helps us in terms of parenting, in terms of human relations, in terms of uh, family matters. And there are so many beautiful lessons that I encourage every one of you to look at this hadith a little bit deeply and try to learn from these lessons, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. Uh, according to the program, I was asked to speak about discrimination, racial discrimination and premarital sex. I don't know what's the relation between these two, <laughs> but <laughs> I, I like just to uh, remind you with one verse in Surah Ali Imran. That's verse number 186, where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, لَتُبْلَوُنَّ فِي أَمْوَالِكُمْ وَأَنفُسِكُمْ وَلَتَسْمَعُنَّ مِنَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْكِتَابَ مِنْ قَبْلِكُمْ وَمِنَ الَّذِينَ أَشْرَكُوا أَذًا كَثِيرًا وَإِنْ تَصْبِرُوا وَتَتَّقُوا فَإِنَّ ذَلِكَ مِنْ عَزْمِ الْأُمُورِ Certainly, assuredly, you will be tried and tested in your property, in your persons. And you'll hear things that you wouldn't like from the people of the book who came before you and from the idolaters. But if you... Uh, be resilient if you exercise patience and taqwa, this is the best way out for you. So this verse tells us that uh, racial discrimination, discrimination in general, uh, is something that's, that's part of life and is going to happen for us, not only for the young youth in their universities and their schools, no, it's going to happen for every one of us. And what our attitude should be, we should not accept it. We should challenge it. We should be patient, exercise patience, and exercise taqwa, because taqwa is what's going to help us in finding ways to challenge this at a level uh, where we can find solutions at a structured level where we as uh, Muslims 
uh, can put our hands together and can help our institution solution for such uh, malaise in, in, in the society. But don't feel bad about it. Take it as test from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because he told us this and expect it to happen but in the same time don't accept it. Challenge it in the right way and equip yourself with patience as well as taqwa to help you in challenging, challenging, challenging it. Uh, the other point uh, just I'd like to touch upon about this uh, premarital sex according to the FYI, uh, the institute that Sister Samira is, is uh, the director of, uh, they had a study, a survey among Muslim students, and they found that 48% of female students, they practice premarital sex. 57% of male students, they did. Uh, the environment is very serious and has huge impact. And it depends whom are you surrounding yourself with. What's your company? What are the precautions that you are taking not to do this mistake? And there are many good ways of helping our young men, our young ladies, not to fall in these mistakes. And inshallah, Rabbil Alameen, maybe during the question answer session, we can talk about some of these. Uh, and uh, I hope that uh, it doesn't happen to any of our loved ones. I hope that we ha will have the strength, we'll use the proper way of parenting as parents, and we'll use the proper way of educating as educators so we can have, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen, uh, the good results in terms of the good products, uh, uh, a strong, confident personality of our youth so they wouldn't uh, be a follower or act as an imma'a, but they feel proud of their identity as Muslims and they can say no to things without uh, any hesitation they feel proud of their identity as Muslims and they are very confident of what they believe in. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us from those who listen and follow the best of what they listen. Aqulu qawli hadha wa astaghfirullah li wa lakum. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الصلاة والسلام على رسول الكريم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل لقطة من لساني يفقه قولي السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته So um, Omar has said uh, you know okay you know we should talk seven minutes and I just told him as I got off got on here that um, he may have to push me off the stage because this is a topic that I am very passionate about um, because it impacts me personally. Um, I grew up, so like many of the young people here today, um, grew up here in America. And as I was growing up, you know, I went to the same masjid, same Sunday school, same programs. And as I was growing up, I saw slowly but surely Many of my friends started getting involved in drugs, having, you know, having issues with um, parent problems, problems with discrimination, having problems with the law. I, typical suburban kids, you know, parents are from good families, very Islamically oriented. And yet, you know, we had all this going on. And my nickname as a kid was Curious George. Because my question to everything was, but why? But why? And so that actually developed into my future, um, and I became a researcher. And so as I would see my friends um, getting involved in drugs and getting wasted on Saturday night and you know, finding out about things afterwards, 
it really made me wonder, okay, well, what is going on? Is our community a very specific community? Or is this going on throughout the nation? And as I got involved in mass, um, mass youth, what I noticed was that this was not specific to our community. And so I actually ended up doing a career in this and did research. Um, and some of the research, if you, if you, when you came in, you saw a bunch of boards which had information on alcohol use, drug use, um, premarital sex. All of this is our, the research that we did at the Family and Youth Institute. Um, and what we found was much more than many of us had ever expected. Um, in terms of alcohol use, right? Um, we see that, for example, one in two college students had drank in the last year. Now, anybody who's on college campuses, that doesn't surprise you, and you'd probably say it's much more. But for many of us parents, it was kind of like, oh, how, what's going on? Um, and so and then the, f the next question is, well, when did they start? What's happening? And you find out, we start digging into it, and we see, well, they're actually starting at home. And so then that kind of got us into FYI and thinking, okay, well, we need to understand what's underlying these issues. And then from there, we need to engage in preventative work so that we can really help support young people. And I think part of what we're gonna do today is really think about that a little bit more with your questions. Um, but I wanted to give a, just a couple thoughts for you. Um, when we look at it, we think, of, we understand a little bit more about, well, these behaviors that we call risky behaviors, they're actually just symptoms to the problem, right? The problem is much deeper. Problem, there are multiple different reasons for these problems, and I'll just list a few. What we see is, you know, one, there's a real lack of connection. Connection with our parents, with our families, in terms of extended families, in terms of our peers. We have friends, but it's really superficial. There isn't that depth to the relationship, that ukhua. We lack connection with our community. Yes, we may go to the masjid, but that's not our home. There is, um, there's a lot of, there's a feeling of, well, at the masjid, if I do this, I have this identity one way, but then when I'm at school, I'm a totally different person. And online, it's totally different. And so we've kind of, to have different lives going on because we, as parents and as community, we encourage it unknowingly, right? We don't allow young people to kind of explore their identity and help them navigate through that. We make it difficult when they make a mistake, young people are automatically ostracized. And so as a community and as parents, we really need to know and understand, yes, we may have expectations, Yes, maybe we may have desires, but we need to guide and walk with young people. We need to speak with young people as opposed to at young people. And there's a huge difference. The, the example of the hadith, uh, the Prophet um, that Omar mentioned earlier, right? The young Sahabi came up and said, I wanted to commit zina, right? Now, if anybody ever said that at the masjid, you know what the reaction would have been that. And you know, the, you know, the news service would be all over and everybody would be talking about it and whatever, right? in terms of the adults, the kids wouldn't care, right? But the issue is, can that person express their opinions honestly, authentically? And can that person then be helped to navigate the realities that they live in? That's a question, are we doing that? Are we allowing for mistakes to happen or are we ostracizing? And those are the things that we need to think about it. So, I mean, just to kind of conclude, because I know I'm running out of time, there's three intervention points that I really want us to think about. What can we as young people growing up in America do? Like, because we're not, like we have ability, we have power, right? Let's use that power. Second, parents, we need to be more intentional in how we interact, what we do, what we don't do. And third, as community members, as a community, we need to have more youth-centered programming. We need to have activities that are in we need to have activities that are empowering. We need spaces and places for youth to have a voice. And we need to 
help mentor young people so that they're able to develop. Now, I know there's a lot that's covered, but what I would urge you, if you are interested in understanding this more deeply, if you go to the FYI, the FYI.org, on our website, there's actually a 40-page document that breaks it down in terms of what's the development, what's the environment of young people, what do we know about the research, what are the things that we need to consider for specific youth populations, and then what can you practically do um, as a community, as parents. So I would urge you, if you can, to, to go to the website, the FYI.org. There's also information outside. Um, at, we have a table in front of the spousal room, the one, S106, as well as um, outside. So if you want more details of what to do and how you can, you can implement this, I would recommend you go to our website. Jazakallah khair. Assalamu alaikum. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Ashhadu an la ilaha illallah wa ashhadu anna Muhammadan rasulullah. Allahumma salli wa sallim barik ala nabiyyina Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallim tasim kathira. Begin by praising Allah the most high, the most exalted, testifying to his oneness and greatness and testifying to the prophethood of his most beloved Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Uh, very honor privilege being in front of all of you, especially Dr. Uh, Bashir, Dr. Ahmed. Uh, we ask Allah to accept from everybody here and we ask Allah uh, to lead us in Allah to really some really productive solutions. Dr. Uh, Samir Ahmed beautifully uh, illustrated that uh, a lot of times, uh, especially at conventions, conferences, um, alhamdulillah speakers are given some great topics. I've been an attendee for a long time. Uh, I consider myself a child of conventions and conferences and many times some you know uh, what is addressed to the problem at hand is not really the solution uh, and I think it's really focus, important for us to focus on the solution so really the the, the point that I want to focus on um, with uh, Dr. Bashir's uh, topic of um, uh, whether it's discrimination or premarital sex or drugs or lack of an identity with Dr. Ahmed uh, is that there is an underlying point that I wanted to share and I think I can share this by uh, asking everybody questions. So how, many, how many people in here uh, are over, don't, don't be shy, over the age of 40 years old? How many people in here over the age of 40 years old? Great, keep your hands up. If you are experienced ever in the past or currently uh, really strong, rebellious behavior from your children, particularly adolescents. Keep your hands up. Wonderful. Put your hands down. Uh, how many people here are under the age of 25? If you're under the age of 25, raise your hands. Great. How many of you in here have ever heard the rebellious stories of your parents as you were growing up about how extremely rebellious they were when they were youngsters? Keep your hands up. Okay, wonderful. Thank you very much. Uh, there is a reality, um, and there's deep, deep issues uh, that we on the outside see behaviors that, that we don't like. As parents or mentors or young people, uh, we, when we're trying to work with somebody younger than us, develop them, nurture them, grow them, many times we see the behaviors that we don't like and we react to behavior, not understanding, as Dr. Samira beautifully put it, that there are much deeper, more foundational problems at hand. And I'm, alhamdulillah, I've been a youth, I, uh, somehow by chance I've been a youth director by, on purpose uh, for eight years, alhamdulillah, about. And then I realized I've been working with youth for over 10 years and I've been a youth director full time for eight years. And then I realized, you know, just experience and winging it doesn't really solve the issues. I've got to dive in deeper to understand the reality of what's going on through a research and scientific based approach. And when I did, I really, we understand that we are very superficial in how we address problems. It's like when my wife sends me to fix the issue with plumbing at the sink and I'm playing with the faucet and trying to figure out and re reassembling the faucet. And really, it's a plumbing issue. It's much deeper at hand. Young people, one of their major, the major issues that happen, my topic was atheism, tremendous rebellion philosophically against Islam, and extremism, tremendous rebellion, rebellion against the principles of the deen, particularly extreme against other people. Both of these are extremes that stem from the attitude or the psychology of rebellion. And we have to understand that rebellious young people is extremely healthy and important for them to do. 
It's a natural, def- it's, they're supposed to be rebellious, just like the parents in here were rebellious when they were younger. All the mentors have been rebellious. But understanding the reality of rebellion brings you to a conclusion that addresses atheism or drugs or alcohol or violence or discrimination or premarital sex. All of them stem, one of the areas that they stem from is this attitude of rebellion and how we deal with it. Rebellion for adolescents is important for them to do three important things. Number one, to distinguish themselves from you as a mentor or a peer or an elder, a community leader, a parent. When your child starts to go through adolescence, they don't want to be your little kid anymore. And it's really hard being a, a father of two to imagine that day. I, I unfortunately work with your kids for most of you. It's really hard to understand that reality that they don't want to be your little kid anymore. They want to be their own person. So it's natural for them to become, number one, distinct from you. Number two, they want to test the limits of where they can go. And the way you react to those limits being pushed is the way that they respond in a healthy or unhealthy, in a productive or unproductive manner. So when they come to you with the hair that's colored, or the, the, the clothing that looks like they're from another planet, or when they have all these weird behaviors, understand the underlying reality of what's going on deeper and down. And number three is that rebellion is, for, for, many pe- for many times, a way for young people to find their challenge in life, to find who they are. And those three elements, inshallah and we'll discuss some of the other solutions, but those three elements are solved through one simple thing that I want to focus on, and at least in this part, which is empowerment. Giving people, young people, the opportunity and being, giving them the platform to be empowered. And that starts very simply. I get the, you know, just a couple of weeks ago, the teenage boy that's fighting with his mom. His mom can't stand, fights every day. What is it about it? What's wrong? You sit down. My mom doesn't even let me walk out the door without having to put an undershirt on. How can, how can I, how, how, how can I be a man if I'm always being so micromanaged and controlled? How do I deal with a young man? He wants to be, a, he wants to be like, the, he wanted to be like the mayor of New York. He wanted to be a politician. His dad told him, you are not a part of my family. If you don't go to med school, go to med school, then do whatever you want to do. The kid is in med school. And he's going to finish med school and go to law school. Because the lack of empowerment within not just parents, but also from a systematic communal structure. We don't empower young people. I was the, at a communal level. We don't empower youth properly as well. Sister Samita was talking about youth programs. Alhamdulillah, privilege over, you know, since I was in college, all I've done is youth programs. I go to Masajid that kicked me out. Uh, you know, gr- can you imagine a group of high school and college kids, like 30, 40 deep, we're rolling, you know, we roll together, we walk in, have a nice lecture, eat some pizza, enjoy ourselves, hang out. And they removed me from the message because, you know, the kids, they got the carpet from Turkey kind of dirty. And we don't really want any youth in the masjid anymore. Thank you very much, Brother Ami. Take your services elsewhere. And that seems like, oh my God, what a horrible masjid. That's the reality of many centers today. And actually begins in the way we deal with our children from a very young age. Empowerment is what the Prophet ﷺ did with Usama and Ibn Abbas and Aisha and Fatma. He was what he, the Prophet ﷺ raised in his home only transformational leaders. Zaid, Ali, Fatma, and when he got married to Aisha very young, all of them became transformational leaders through that empowerment. When we are willing to empower young people, and we'll talk about what that means, making decisions, having space to make mistakes, to fall, to to make the wrong choices, and you guide them from there, that is a number one, inshallah ta'ala, way in resolving the attitude of Rebellion and empowering our young people, inshallah ta'ala, to turn those, that rebellion into a positive uh, direction. Inshallah, within the questions, I'm sure that we'll address this a lot more. Uh, and inshallah ta'ala, we'll talk about atheism and extremism, uh, hopefully in more detail as well. Barakallah fikum. Wassalamu alaikum wa Thank you.
So what I'm gonna do is, I'm trying to group them, but there's a huge amount. So we'll go inshallah with some common themes, and we'll start with uh, Dr. Rilla. One theme that I'm seeing a lot here is uh, youth who have already fallen into premarital relations, and some of them are saying that they stopped, meaning that they repented, and now they're afraid when it comes to uh, looking for marriage, if this is something that's going to hold them back. Some are saying that they feel even spiritually dead inside because of this action, and how are they supposed to go about now the process of doing it in the halal way after this kind of experience of premarital relations. Dr. Rizal, please. Alhamdulillah, wassalatu wassalamu ala rasulillah. Alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made always ways out for us. And he gave us many opportunities. When we make mistakes, we can come back to him. Uh, uh, as uh, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi said, Kullu ibn Adam khatta. Every human being would make mistakes. No one is perfect. But Alhamdulillah, rabbil alameen, the door of tawbah is open. And as long as we go about it the right way, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will help us to start fresh and do the right thing. So now, the best thing to do after you make tawbah, to be strong in your tawbah, is to surround yourself with people who are committed to work for the sake of this deen. Surround yourself with good company, so they will support you and you'll be able not to get back to uh, these mistakes, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. That's one thing. The second thing is, uh, you, when you want to go for, 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 for marriage, uh, you have to really to work very hard and understand everything about what marriage means. What are the objectives of marriage? Uh, what, what, are the, uh, what is the nature of marriage? Uh, the gender relationship in Islam. Many of our young people, uh, they, they, they go about it in the wrong way and they take it very lightly. And subhanAllah, uh, uh, the, some of them even call it uh, halal dating. <laughs> We're not allowed to date as Muslims, so I, I, I'll try. I'll get married and if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Uh, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, uh, it is a mithaq ghaliz, a solemn covenant, a strong pledge. It is ayah from ayat Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It has to be taken very seriously. So approach marriage in a very serious way. Take a premarital uh, uh, counseling uh, course uh, before you get to get married to really understand what marriage is all about. So inshallah, Rabbil Alameen, when you get married, you will have the foundation. You understand uh, what to expect, and you do the right thing, and you work hard to commit for the success of this marriage, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. These are a few thoughts that uh, I hope that would help, inshallah. I just, Jazakallah Khair, um, I just want to add a couple more things. Um, for young people in particular, it's really hard not to date. Right? It is really hard. If you think about what goes on in high school, um, just, you know, just in terms of the interaction, the expectations, the norms, it's really hard. And I think one of the things that's, that we need to do, I'm no longer young, but I was at one point, uh, <laughs> to realize and acknowledge that it's okay, it is hard, but that is the challenge. And then to realize, and, and reflect upon well, what are the points where you feel weakest? What are the environmental situations? Where are you? Who are you with? What's happening where you want to slip or if you have slipped, you've actually done it? And work backwards, right? Because if you have that understanding, you have some data. With that data, then you can say, okay, next time, I, these are the things that I need to take in place so that I avoid it next time. And really, you know, subhanAllah, you know, I remember being in high school and 
people were like, oh, it's so hard, you can't date. And I remember used to thinking, oh my God, yeah, it's so hard. We're, it's, so, it's so, you know, whatever, like we're so not lucky, everybody else gets to date and all that. But now that I reflect upon the rules of gender interaction, right? SubhanAllah, it's a mercy from Allah. It truly is a mercy because if you think about it, during this high school and college days, we have those emotions, we have that attraction. It's normal, it's natural, but we need to guide it. We need to channel that en energy. We need to make sure that we're not alone or the opposite gender. We need to be careful of how we're interacting and the manner in which we're speaking because it's only natural that we will slip. Right? And the fact that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has those rules of interaction um, helps us avoid that slipping. And during this time period where we need to be channeling our time and energy towards okay, what are we going to do in terms of a career? What are we gonna, how are we going to make an impact on this world? What, how are we going to learn? All that energy is focused on those things as opposed to the roller coaster of dating. When you're dating, you're not thinking of this is marriage. It's not a long-term commitment. It's just a minute here or there. And the emotional hurt and the drama that's associated, I mean, those of you guys who are in high school, and, you, know, you know it, you see it every day, this happened, that happened, whatever. You're not having to deal with that drama. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been so merciful for, to you. And those of you who have engaged in it, Realize, think and reflect upon that hurt that you've gone through and that pain. You don't have to go through that. Yes, it's temporary holding, you know, keeping yourself, but in the end, when you are ready to get married, you're using your energy and time more effectively. Okay, so to follow up on that, because there's a couple of questions on this, then what does a person do so they... Either they see, you know, there's someone that they know that they're interested in or that they're trying to go about it the right way. And maybe they're not at a position yet where, you know, they feel, you know, they're, they're still in school or whatever it is. What's the, what's the right way to approach someone, if it's someone specifically, or just the right way to go about it to get to know someone then before marriage, if we're saying that we can't do that kind of dating or that kind of getting to know process? It's open one, any of the three. I love marriage. After talking about youth, my second love is marriage. Um, so I'll add, but you know, Sheikh Roda has multiple books on this topic, so I kind of feel strange oh, answering. <laughs> um, one, I just want to share some con con concepts that for, for people to think about. We have Islam and we have culture. And sometimes there is overlap and sometimes that's not. So it's important that we're clear what Islam says and then adjust Islam to our culture. So some of our, some of our cultures from our parents' way is not always Islamic, and some of the things that we do in America is not always Islamic, so we need to figure that out. So a couple ideas, depending on the different cultures you're from. Um, one of the things is oftentimes if you see someone on campus, or even in high school, you may find someone and you're attracted to them. You know, first thing, you know, talk to somebody who is older, more mature. Ideally, that would be your parents. Um, it's okay to give them a heart attack on this topic, inshallah. I mean, I did that to my parents. I remember I was in 12th grade, and I told my parents, um, I'm interested in this person. And immediately, my parents had a heart attack. But what that also helped them do is have that trust and that awareness that if there is somebody, my daughter will come to me. And that's really important because your parents have your best heart, your best interest at stake. Sometimes that doesn't work. It's, then you can, you can approach an older uncle in the commuter, an, an older auntie, or you can approach a youth director or another mentor. The one thing I ask you not to do is talk to people who have big mouths. Don't tell them. Because then the whole community will know and there will be a big drama and you don't want it. What if it doesn't work out? So really take a strategic approach to doing that. But the, another thing you could do is if you're working on activities together, you get a sense of what the other person is about. 
But when it, talks, when it comes to marriage, before you talk about a person, first know yourself. Knowing yourself makes a huge difference in terms of finding a compatible companion. There are lots of great brothers out there. There are lots of great sisters out there. But not every good brother is meant for every good sister. And I, you know, Sheikh Rada has a book, um, Blissful Marriage. There's many other books out there on marriage that I highly recommend that you look into even before you get married. I mean, because that gives you an idea, a framework to look at. And then when, as you're, you know, see people, then you can evaluate. Does this person make sense for me? He or she may be a great person, but is that person right for me? And there's a lot, if you want, um, we actually send out articles, I think, every week on, on marriage topics um, at the Family Youth Institute. So I highly recommend uh, you reading those articles as well. Just in the same line that Sister Samira is talking about, get to know yourself first. And one thing that would help you a lot, in our book, Blissful Marriage, chapter three, the process of selection, we have two questionnaires, one for female candidate, one for male candidate. Take these questionnaires and complete them. You will know a lot about yourself. And be honest with yourself while you're completing them. I'm not telling you this so you can go and buy the book. I just send me an email, I send you the questionnaire, okay? So take this. <laughs> uh, it is, it is, it teach you a lot about yourself. And when you feel that this is you, this is really you, and you are interested in somebody, uh, as Sister Samira said, through your parents, through an, an elder in the community, <clears throat> but never speak to him directly. Uh, try to get him also to complete this questionnaire. You will learn a lot about him, about her, and this way you can make a learned uh, decision whether there will be uh, a reasonable amount of compatibility between you and him or her. So try to find as much information as you can about the other candidate in the right way, of course. <clears throat> blissful <coughs> blissful uh, marriage. Blissful. blissful marriage? There's also another interesting book called How to Avoid Marrying a Jerk <laughs> by John Van App. Yeah. It's actually really good. It talks about more in terms of dating, but you can apply it towards, uh, you know, in terms of marriage and stuff like that. How to Avoid Marrying a Jerk. I really like it. <laughs> Since we are talking about references, uh, there is another good uh, book written by Muslim uh, Sister Salma Abu Jidari and uh, Imam uh, Muhammad Najid. Before tying the knot, that's another very good book that you can uh, utilize. And can we have to get the marriage questions out of the way first? Which I'm looking over now. Uh, so this, there's a, a few questions also about dealing with atheism and agnostic thoughts in young Muslims. What advice can we give to someone who is struggling with those kind of thoughts, sincerely trying to uh, figure their way out if they have these thoughts? Brother Ramin? <clears throat> Bismillah. Uh, so, I, so I'm not sure if a, a, an adult is answer, asking this question or if it's, um, if it's a young person, so I'll try to address it from both angles. Uh, most of the time, atheism, uh, the times that I've been encountered, or even from different uh, research or from psychology, most of the time, people that have these doubts, it's not a philosophical issue that they're having. Uh, I was with a young girl a couple of weeks ago. Uh, her mom told me, oh, she's, you know, she's having a lot of doubts going through Asian, this, that, or the other. Uh, I sit down with her, I talk to her a little bit, and she just, she's gone through emotional, spiritual abuse. Forced to Islamic school, always forced, Dean is always forced down her throat. So it becomes when the Dean, it's a, Beautiful, gorgeous thing. But when we use it in mean or, uh, you know, in destructive ways, it destroys people's psyche. So they want to rebel against the deen. It's not an, most of the time, it's not a philosophical discourse that they need. It's not ayat and hadith. It's not metaphysical analysis of the universe. It's really an emotional issue deep within them that they've been tra traumatically uh, exposed to. 
either in a masjid or by a person of knowledge or a person of uh, leadership or scholarship or by a parent or a mentor or something of that sort. Usually that's the issue. And again, if we analyze things deeper, and I believe, by the way, the same way, my other topic was extremism. Extremism for most of the time is the same way. There's emotional pain. There's a pain of losing family, seeing devastation, seeing destruction around you. So the response is this rebellion of aggression and extremism. And subhanAllah, both are rooted most of the time in that sense. If it's not rooted for young people and being, a, alhamdulillah, also, uh, you know, uh, living here my whole life, definitely I went through a phase, especially in college, where you start to question things. Because we've never been, the, our communities don't challenge us in questions. And I think it's really important that we understand philosophically, Allah Azza wa challenges our mind to find His existence in the Qur'an. Right? Allah goes to the point of saying, look, you're the creator, okay? I'm khuliqu min ghayri shay. Have you been created from nothing? Go down that path and figure out how you came to creation by yourself. Am humul khaliqun. Are you the creator of yourself? Go ahead, go down that path and engage it. It's a, it's a direct challenge by the creator about his own existence. And that's normal and healthy. That's actually in persuasion science. It's better to show people the other side and it gives them a stronger opinion of what they come to. The, that's how you come to the truth. When you never expose people to the other side, they will rebel. <laughs> right? This is, this is the way humans are. So this exposure on both sense in our communities, in understanding, I, I, I have a, a series on YouTube called Why God? We assessed and challenged the God, concept of God from every angle, historical, philosophical, metaphysical. And we, we, I, you know, we try to come to a conclusion of how we understand Allah and the Creator through science, through the objective analysis of the universe. And that way you're showing the other side. That is an important, very, very important way in, if, if you're a young person, that you sit with somebody that is trained or uh, somebody, especially from a psychological perspective, if there's emotional issues there, or if it's an intellectual issue, somebody that is very well trained in understanding how to answer your questions. And by the way, uh, just like myself, I'm sure probably a lot of young people in here, you might go up to somebody and they might tell you, don't ask this question. Your mom, your sheikh, don't, we, we, no, don't ask that question. That's okay. You know what you're supposed to do? Go ask the question of somebody else. That's all you're supposed to do. Because the answers are always there. If we're afraid of, as Muslims, if we're afraid of somebody challenging our deen, then we have a major problem in being Muslim. We should be very comfortable with people challenging us philosophically or from a, from a spiritual or a mindset perspective. No problem. We come, we'll find the answer. And that's inshallah that should be our approach. Of course, Allah, that we start to train people that are able to do that as well. And that's extremely important. Youth directors, uh, youth counselors, mashayikh, people of scholar, people that are speaking. They have to be able to be trained in that understanding or lead people to people that have expertise in those, in those arenas, inshallah ta'ala. Jazakallah I'm still getting marriage questions. But, uh, so this one is, is coming up a lot, and this I think is a two-way question. I'm getting it from parents, it seems, and from the youth. Uh, so it's the issue of, you know, the youth saying that, what do we do if our parents are difficult to deal with? They don't listen to us, they don't listen to our ideas, our thoughts, they don't respect our ideas and thoughts, and this can be towards marriage, towards career. And then you have on the other side, parents as well, who are saying that, what do we do if our kids are not listening, shutting us out completely, have no respect, so it's, it's a two-way thing. So, I'll let you guys figure it out. Uh, when these things happen, there must be something behind the scene. Why it is happening? Parents, when they cannot speak to their ch with their children, not a, it means that they did not really invest. When you are parenting them, to find this very strong emotional bond between them and the children. It's very, very important that the parents invest to have very strong emotional bond between themselves and their children 
and have an open channel of communication. When this is available, you can discuss anything with your children and the children would respond in the right way. And so if, if, if the teenager or the uh, marriage age uh, young man uh, is trying to tell his parents something and they, they don't listen, <clears throat> try to find somebody whom they respect within the community and ask him to interfere or to speak on your behalf. And, uh, and for, for the parents themselves, uh, I think they should realize that uh, when they have older children at marriage age, they have to listen to them. They have to let them express their feelings and their thoughts and their ideas and the, as long as it is, uh, it is, it is uh, uh, not against any Islamic values, they have to listen to them and they have to try to come up with, with negotiate certain deals with each other that make themselves both happy, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen. Again, we have in our Muslim teens book, we have uh, like, a, a contract that parents can write with their teens if they want them to change certain habits and the teens will get also certain feedback from the parents on this basis. That helps tremendously because the teen feels that he or she is expressing themselves and this is one of the uh, biggest needs for teenagers is to express themselves and to feel that they are uh, independent. And when you do this contract in the right way with your teens, they feel that they are being respected, they are giving the chance to express themselves, they are being dealt with as an adult, and they will come up with some very good things. And sometimes they, they may put even stricter consequences on themselves compared to what you were going to put yourself on them. If, you, if you've done it just one way, you know. Let's have this dialogue, let's discuss things, and let them express their feelings, and then reach a, a, like a agreeable conclusion, and follow up in, in trying to implement it, inshallah. <coughs> Just wanted to add a little bit to that. Um, one of the things that we do a lot of pre-marriage workshops, and over and over again, what happens is, the feedback we get is, you need a separate one for parents. And what, the question is, what we're finding is, is sometimes parents have, and we do have one, by the way, um, sometimes <coughs> parents have unrealistic expectations. We'll, we want to have someone from our village, from our city. We want them to have this kind of educational status or this amount of financial background, right? And you're looking at all these kind of dunya-ish things, which are important. I'm not saying it's not important. But they're not looking at what are the compatibility factors, right? You know, if someone was born and raised here and someone who isn't even here yet but is back home, that's a huge cross-cultural difference, and that needs to be understood. It doesn't mean that's impossible. What it does mean is there are many challenges that need to be understood before that happens. That's one. Another issue a lot of times, um, parents, particularly when they have young women who are a little bit older and they're not married yet, they start to act as if, you know, like all the world is going to come to an end because their daughter is not married. Married. Yes, it's something to worry about, but their identity, their self-worth is not tied to marriage. And that's another source of tension between parents and, and, and young people, um, is really how are you approaching this marriage? And how, what are the values? And I would start off with, you know, we talked about knowing yourself. You know, knowing your child. Have that conversation of what are the values for, that, your, that your child has. What matters? Everybody's personality is different. And they, you know, you, 
you need to find someone that will help nurture your spa, the, your child so that they are truly who they are, not trying to be fit into a box, right? You want to grow, you want your child to be happy and fulfilled, all that. You can't just t take some random guy and random ran girl and put them together. It just doesn't work that way. So that's from the parent side. From the, from the, from the young person side, um, again, communication is really important. You need to, like, if you're saying no to somebody or if you want to have somebody, you know, really sit down and have that conversation with your parent and explain these are the traits that that person has. This is what I appreciate. This is what I'm looking for to, com you know, to kind of help support me to be a better person and have those conversations. Sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes you need to get other people involved in that process, and sometimes you just have to be, you have to wait it through, right? And those are the things that you have to, we need to do, because if this is someone that you are truly committed and interested in, then it may be worth waiting. I think flipping back to the parents, if you keep saying no to somebody that your child has said over and over and over again, I want this person and only this person, at some point, you have a choice. Either you're going to lose your child, either they're going to cut off relations with you, or they're going to commit zina, or they're going to just get married without you. And what type of, what type of impact is that going to have on your family? Right? It may not be your number one choice, but if this person, no matter, if your child, no matter what you're saying, is still not budging, maybe they need to go ahead with that and you just need to be content and supportive of that. So things to think about. And the marriage questions are still coming up as well. Uh, Shall we be talking about an after <laughs> session for those? Uh, there's a question on... Brother Omar, oh. just uh, what Sister Samira just said is, is uh, a really major fiqhi rule in usul al-fiqh. Daf'u al-dar al-akbar bil dar al-azhar. You have two options. You see which is the lesser harm. And you take the one with the lesser harm. Rather than, <coughs> end, <coughs> excuse me, rather than ending up with the, a bigger harm. <coughs> so, Brother Romney, there's a question on uh, someone who's saying that they have a family member who was involved in a lot of bad things and they've said that they don't really care about the akhirah. And this is something that we've seen a lot as well, is just the general apathy towards anything related to the deen, that it's not relevant, it's not something that actually plays a role in their life. How do we address that? <clears throat> so, uh, so, so for, uh, I, want to, I want to address this, uh, I, I guess I want to say the, the answer really honestly. Because uh, the akhira, for the most part, the way we learn about it, uh, it's really dull place. <laughs> uh, you know, I think Lord of the Rings and Stranger Things are, have a lot more hype than like Jannah. <laughs> and it's, it's really interesting that, you know, I got, so I guess I'm going to focus on the discourse of how, we're, how we convey Islam to our younger generation. Uh, you know, I, I, for the most part, you know, our mindset as Muslims, especially our Muslim community, parents, leaders, mentors, uh, we're extremely, we, we, we like to preserve. We want to preserve our deen, preserve our kids, make sure everything's fine. And our, I'm not going to tell you too much. I just want to make sure everything's so preserved. Whereas the deen in and of itself is extremely transformative. That's the essence of our deen. The message came and took shepherds of goats and camels and made them the greatest leaders of humanity. That's not a deen that is defensive and protective. That is a deen that's transformative. One of the ways it transformed them was gave, it gave them this amazing vision of a world that was so challenging to get to, but they would live their life getting there, which is akhirah. And it was given in tremendous detail. My entire khutbah last week was about the vision for 2018 and making Jannah the number one part of that vision for your life. And Jannah is an amazing place that we don't hear anything about or enough about or it's not, it's not nice enough. Right? I'd rather, oh, uh, oh, drinks that have sweet, oh, that's my boba. Yeah, I'll just go to boba and get that. Oh, you know, rivers with gardens. Yeah, oh, yeah, that's, that's you know, Kanye's mansion. Oh, yeah, inshallah, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get there. You know, there. There's no enticement 
There's no, there's no grander vision that I want to live my life for this akhirah. And so again, we have a philosophical, we have a major intellectual issue in how we convey what Allah Azza wa spent on. Allah spent 13 years telling companions about Jannah in its tremendous detail, in its vividness. It was like they were watching, you know, binging on Netflix. Just Jannah series, Jannah, 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 Jannah right? That was it. And that, that amazing place was that they dedicated their lives to. We don't spend enough time trying to, not just, not just convey it in the proper way, we don't even train people how to convey things to young people in the right way. We don't even train them to do that. So there has to be a deeper sense of, of us as parents, as mentors, or even as you as a young person, make Jannah an amazing place. It is a wonderful place, al akhirah in general, right? The vividness of al akhirah The more that we consciously work on making that picture amazing in our minds, that'll strengthen our belief. And inshallah ta'ala, again, that'll remove that apathy. But if it's just like, oh, rivers and a garden, yeah. Oh, that's like, sounds like the whack park my parents take me to all the time. Yeah, no, I'm good, you know. I, uh, you know, I don't need Jannah. I'm, 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 I'm watching, you know, somebody's snap stories and they're in, and they're in Bora Bora. That looks, I want to get there. I want to be a YouTube star. Get 5 million subscribers and just travel to Bor- from Bora Bora to Hawaii the rest of my life. That's Jannah to me. And that's, that's a harsh, it's a harsh challenge. But we have to be, we have to stand up to that challenge of giving that vision to our young people. Allah Ta'ala. Make sure you subscribe to Brother Rami. <laughs> I'm not subscribed to We have time for a few more. Uh, this one has come up a few times. I will direct this one to Dr. Samira. How do we deal with the double standards in the Muslim community? when it comes to all these issues, drugs, alcohol, premarital relations between males and females? So you acknowledge it and you fight it. Very simple. In the sense that what we have to do, the actual doing part is not simple, right? Um, Sometimes it's so ingrained in our culture that parents don't realize it. Communities don't realize it. And if they don't realize, or even if they do realize it, they don't know how to get out of it or change. And so we need to light the fire and bring it up to people's attention over and over and over again. Not just one person. You need to get more people involved in changing that culture in your community. Each time those, those things come up at home or at the masjid, you need, to, you need to stand up and say, no, this is not okay. You cannot just have, you know, all ma- you can't have your exact meetings after Fajr. How are women, are gonna, how are women are gonna be there? How are we gonna do this if we have this, uh, you have to do X, Y, or Z? You need to create open spaces, inclusive spaces. Really push and get allies, male allies, elders, whoever it is, at least from the community perspective, those things. Now with parents, it's a little bit harder. Um, you do nef- definitely need to keep bringing up these issues. You know, you, you let this person, you know, do the, you let my brother do this, and this is that, where is this in Islam? Tell, you know, you k- keep pushing. And yes, they're going to get annoyed, but you say it over and over and over again. They start hearing it, and you, you start showing the ramifications. Oh, it's okay for him to do X, Y, or Z. This is what's going to happen afterwards. Again, get other elders involved, get, help them bring up those issues over again. But don't just let it be, because this is not Islam. This is culture. Um, okay, so this one I'm gonna bring up because it's come up many times, but how do we deal with uh, Muslims who identify as LGBTQ? Uh, and there's a lot of different questions from a lot of different sides on this issue. So how do we deal with Muslims who identify themselves as that, as well as living in a society where that is become the norm? No, no, yeah. I I don't have much knowledge, but I can share what little I do know. And then I hope yeah. others can add to it. Bismillah. Um, so I think one of the things, and I'll, I'll share from a psychological perspective, I have had individuals who I've worked with who have LGBTQ tendencies and were Muslim, practicing Muslims, run to, went to halaqas, led halaqas, 
et cetera. Um, and these individuals were trying to change their situation. And, and we worked and worked and we tried changing um, tendencies. But I think part of the realization is realizing that some people may have these feelings, right? But how do you deal with it as a community, right? You don't hurt them. You don't push them away. It is their struggle. Different people have different struggles. Some people may have a struggle of cancer. Some people may have financial struggles. Some may, people ha may have been abused, um, neglected. The, what I've seen is to, for us to recognize that each person has their struggle. That doesn't mean you can act upon it. You know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has been very clear of what is acceptable, what is not acceptable. But you need to treat individuals with respect, with humanity, with dignity, and help them through their struggle. I once heard the late Dr. Ahmad Al Qadi saying that these feelings could exist. As long as you don't act upon them, they are okay. But never cross the border or, or step over the boundary of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and act upon them. But the feeling could exist. Just to clarify and make sure that. Uh, as Sister Samira said, we should not hurt them, we should not try to help them as long as they are not acting upon these feelings. Allahu Akbar. Sure. Comments? Uh, not right now, because we're just, we're actually going to be ending soon. Uh, if there's something that you want to talk specifically to our panelists about after, please. Thirty seconds. Okay. Uh, it's extremely important that, that Muslims understand what is right and what is wrong according to the establishment. Omar Khan, Omar Khan, Omar Khan, Omar being 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 kind, being uh, however you want to put it, with the Indian community, it is extremely important that we're not promoting. Just one. I think there's. Uh, I think the Yaqeen Institute came out with something. So if people are interested, um, either they have come out or they're coming out with something. One of the two. Um, but I think Yasser Qadi has also addressed this issue. If you want to look at it on YouTube. Um, but I know this is an issue that m many of the scholars are trying to work out and trying to figure out, well, yes, what, we, what I say, said and what Sheikh Rada said, you know, yes, that's reality, but then how do we, what do we do? Like, what's it, what does it look like on the ground? Um, and so I would refer to those individuals because they have been working on kind of, you know, teasing it apart. Yeah. Uh, I, I, uh, I'm sorry, can I go? So I would say just in general, uh, a lot of issues that were discussed, I mean, we, we could take, I'm sure these, these are long things that don't necessarily get dissolved, uh, resolved in one panel. Uh, but I think we should always understand and appreciate any sin or any, again, any behavior. It takes a long time to, for it to be developed, many causes created. And then it takes a long time for it to be removed and, for it, and many causes, many reasons, bring it to an end. And we have to appreciate the process. What, what I think, so, uh, especially as, I think as you, you, know, you become a young parent or parents in general, or, or a mentor or somebody that's guiding people, or even a young person, you have to appreciate the process. Things didn't happen overnight, 
and things don't get resolved overnight with our own individual behavior or communal or societal problems. But the reality is we should understand and appreciate that it is a process and grind through the process correctly. And I think in any, any, any mistake or anything that is a behavior, LGBT, atheism, extremism, premarital sex, all of these, again, are just the surface. How we address them, how we deal with them as young people, how we deal with them as elders or mentors or parents, it needs to, it needs to be and have that patience. That there is a process in, the, in a way that we will resolve these. And if we continue and live to that process, doing it the right way, then inshallah ta'ala things will become better. But if we don't, if we're hasty, if we're not interested, and we're, if we care just about dictating, telling people what to do, telling them we don't, we, we don't want you, we don't need you, get out of here, that will never ever solve any of the problems, right? And I think un adopting that mindset is more important than anything else that we said about solutions. Because the solutions are varied. But the mindset that I will help the process of resolving them is the most important thing, Allah Ta'ala. So we have to conclude now so very, very, very quickly because Salat al will be at 110 in front of S102. Uh, if just to give one last, like a, a last farewell advice, all three of you, something about marriage, please. No, I'm just joking. <laughs> just something in general that you can leave our, uh, the audience with before we conclude. I, I didn't mind. That was all I wanted to say. Okay, that was all. Uh, yeah, was just... Ten seconds. Quick. Inshallah, for, for believers, it's all good. Ajaban la amr al-mu'min, amruhu kulluhu lahu khayr. In asabatuhu dharra'a, sabar fakana khayran lahu. In asabatuhu sarra'a, shakar fakana khayran lahu. It's wondrous, uh, the, the, the fear of a believer, everything that happened to him is good. Whenever he is afflicted by any of these discrimination or any of these things that we talked about, he would be patient, so he will be rewarded for his patience, and that's good for him. And if he is given uh, beautiful things, uh, he will be grateful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, uh, he will be rewarded. So sabr and gratefulness are two very important things that we have to keep in mind, inshallah, Rabbil Alameen.